Cassie Cash, that's Shakespeare Girl. In Elizabethan England, cats came with a mixed bag of reputation and purpose. They were kept as pets, useful as practical mouse catchers in the home. They were symbols of magic and mysticism and even utilized as military weapons of war. The works of William Shakespeare give us a glimpse into the collective opinion of cats during his lifetime by providing over 30 references to the cat in his plays. Some of these references resonate with what we expect a cat's reputation to be, like in The Tempest, Shakespeare says, for all the rest, they'll take suggestion as a cat laps milk. Most of us have seen the cat lap up milk, and we can understand that reference or relate to what Shakespeare's likely talking about there, and he's intending to imply that the rest take suggestions eagerly. And that's an image of the cat that we understand, one of the cat being a pet, and it's rather basic. Cats drink milk. Sure. But then Shakespeare being Shakespeare, he gives us other opinions of cats from Tudor England that are not so ordinary for us today. And they make us ask questions. For example, in Two Gentlemen of Verona, we have this quote, which I really think I ought to frame and hang in my house, as I often feel exactly this way about many of my pets. I think Crab, my dog, to be the sourest natured dog that lives, my mother weeping, my father wailing, my sister crying, our maid howling, our cat wringing her hands, and all our house in a great perplexity. And I don't know about you, but the entire phrase, our entire house in a great perplexity, makes a lot of sense to me. And anyone with pets at home will immediately nod their head or even say out loud in agreement, yes, I know exactly what he's talking about here. And you skip right past the little reference of the cat having hands and wringing his hands. Why does the cat have hands and why is she wringing them? Another great quote that makes sense at first but leaves you with questions is from King Lear. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Now I know King Lear's sanity gets questioned in that play, but does anyone else get perfume from their cat? The silkworm reference makes sense. So does making hides from a beast because we're familiar with leather today. And of course getting wool from a sheep. But there's a history question there in that line about cats. Why would we owe the cat perfume? Answering questions like these that come up in Shakespeare's plays is a great way to explore Tudor England and the time period behind the plays that the bard was writing. And today we're going to take a look at the history of cats in Tudor England, looking at Shakespeare's lifetime in particular and the references to cats in his plays. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII wrote a decree against witches in which he declared specifically that cats were unholy. He ruled that whenever a witch was convicted of her craft, her cat was to be burned at the stake with her. This edict is one reason there's a legend that a black cat will jump from the flames whenever a witch is burned at the stake. The hatred for cats and even for cat lovers, since loving a cat is one way you could get accused of being a witch, meant that cats were often rounded up and exterminated like pests. During Shakespeare's lifetime, the hatred for cats was such that for her coronation, Elizabeth I had a cat burned in a wicker basket to symbolize the releasing of demons. In the mid-1560s, when Shakespeare was just a baby, King Charles IX of France celebrated St. John's Day by having 24 cats publicly burnt as a mark of celebration. And there are even records of the court and lay people participating in this activity like it was this fun, festive thing to burn these cats alive. This was the conflicted opinion of cats during Shakespeare's lifetime and why some of the references from Shakespeare's plays seem to sound weird to us today. Founded by King John in the early 1200s, the Tower of London was actually kept as a zoo. It was full of a large menagerie of exotic animals, but some of the first residents there were cats. The very first thing that ever got put in the Tower of London for the keeping of exotic animals were a pair of lions. And in addition to large cats, many exotic animals would be given to the crown as a gift. And the Tower of London is where they would be kept, both for entertainment and the curiosity of the court that wanted to see these animals they'd never seen anywhere else in England. The first animals to arrive were lions. An elephant and a polar bear were also kept in the Tower of London. And later came tigers, kangaroos, and ostriches. There are remains in the tower that were found of a Barnaby lion, which was thought to be the largest and heaviest of all lion species. Shakespeare talks about owing a cat perfume, and following the rest of that statement, it seems as if 
Shakespeare is referring to the perfume trade. During his lifetime, cats were a source of musk that was used in cosmetics and perfumes for a wide swath of society. Perfumers, apothecaries, and grocers would trade in goods prepared from either living or dead turtles, bears, and what's called a kibbit cat. Elizabeth also kept a pet monkey in the palace, a parrot in a cage, and she kept a kibbit cat known for its musk-like odor. Now, the kibbit is a mammal, and it lives in Africa and the East Indies, which is likely why Elizabeth had it, because she was big into trade and exploration in those areas, and this cat was probably returned to her from one of those journeys. It's a little animal, and it has a cat-like body and long legs, a long tail, and it looks a lot like what a skunk looks like today, what you think of as a skunk, or maybe a raccoon or a weasel. It's that kind of animal. And it is distantly related to the domestic cat, but the kibbit is not a cat in the same sense, but that is what it was called, which is likely what Shakespeare was referring to in that quote from his play, because it was capable of producing this strong, pungent odor that was popular in aromatics like perfume. A secretion from the anal glands of kivets was one of the most expensive materials used by 17th century apothecaries and perfumers. Now, it was not only for scents, it was also a popular treatment for a whole lot of ailments. It cost about two pounds an ounce, and even being charged right down to the grain, like they would get it way, way down. It was this highly, highly expensive thing and considered, you know, a lot like saffron today would be you know you could buy a little bitty bit of it and it costs a whole lot and it has a lot of places that it gets used the liquid nature of kivet secretions made it easy to add in homeopathic treatments to aid in what 17th century england called humoric ailments you could treat fatigue stomach sickness colic and you could even give it to pregnant women as a way to protect the baby in the womb anytime your bodily humors seemed out of order Kivet secretions and the tinctures and various medicinal products that were created for this purpose could be used to treat them. Now, as a fragrance, the kivet was used to scent linen, pomades, or handkerchiefs. Many perfumers would mix the kivet secretions with floral scents like roses, and it could be put into creams. And it was used as, as a common aphrodisiac, actually. And you see portraits of Elizabeth and Mary with pomanders, and those could have been scented with civet. French perfumer Pierre Pomme considered an English-produced kivet to be the finest. And in the late 17th century, two men named John Barksdale and Daniel Defoe decided to capitalize on this opinion by becoming what is known as the Kivet Merchants. They owned 70 of these cats, and they built a special house that they constructed for the care of these animals. They, each cat was valued at 12 pounds per cat, which is an extraordinary sum of money. And they were nurtured and cared for by merchants and apothecaries who wanted to use the excretions from these cats in their products. The men would prepare meat, fish, boiled eggs, and rice in precise methods, thinking that a quality diet would lead to quality excretions from the Kivet. And they wanted this high quality scent, so they were nurturing their product. Now, they were not at all concerned with animal cruelty in Elizabethan England, and not only would these cats regularly have their anal glands scraped, a process that was really hard to even read about to learn what was going on because it was painful and it would result in the cat's death if you did it too frequently and they had a schedule down where they knew how often you could extract the secretions and not kill the animal. These merchants and apothecaries would even display their caged cats for customers as a way to demonstrate their prowess in perfuming as well as their freshest possible ingredient. Pictures of the Kivet cat were often used in the marketing materials for these businesses, including trading cards and business signs. Sir Hugh Platt's Elizabethan recipe recommended immersing the secretions from the Kivet cat in rose water, and his recipe included laudanum, benzoin, storaxes, ambergris, kivet, and musk. These recipes were made into popular perfumes that were usually only available to the wealthy, but I'm sure William Shakespeare would have smelled the scent created from a Kivet cat at court and 
moving among the high-ranking people he moved around. One of the most amazing and bizarre roles of cats, as if the creation of perfume wasn't enough, was that cats were actually used as a military weapon during Shakespeare's lifetime. It was an actual strategy to burn down the town that you were besieging, to strap flammable material to a cat, and set the cat on fire and let it loose in the town. And I can provide references for this because I am not making it up. One of my sources is from National Geographic. So this is a real thing, it really happened. But the cats were extremely hard to catch anyway. And so once you set it on fire, it's even that much harder to catch. And so the cat would run flaming and mercilessly spread fire all over an entire town during what is ultimately the death run of this cat. Now, depictions of this cat have added whimsy to them to make the reality of the situation seem less macabre than it was, but cats are listed in a manual for early explosive and warfare from the 16th and 17th century. Birds were used along with cats as this kind of bomb that they would set off, and this idea came from a man named Franz Helm of Cologne. He served with the Turkish forces in the mid 16th century and it's his manuals where he lists the explosive cats under the heading of to set fire to a castle or city which you can't get at otherwise and this section of the book goes on to give instructions about how to use doves and cats armed with flammable devices to set fire to enemy camps the book demonstrates a grisly situation for these poor forlorn cats, which you can officially feel sorry for because they would capture the cats from their homes and then set them loose because the cat would run back home and try to hide. And it would hide in highly flammable places like a barn or someplace with hay where it was very, very easy to catch fire and the cat would instinctively think to hide there, but in so doing would unwittingly set ablaze large structures that were difficult to squelch leading to a town fire. And when they weren't being used as military weapons, kept as sideshow curiosities, burned at the stake along with witches, or having their glands harvested for symbols of wealth and status, cats were, on occasion, kept as regular household pets during Tudor England. That's surprising, considering if I were a cat, at this point I'd be done with humans. But it seems there were still a few cats willing to lend their assistance to families as a household pet. During the reign of Richard III, Henry Wyatt was imprisoned in the Tower of London, and he claimed he was saved from starvation by a cat who daily brought him a pigeon. After he was released under Henry VII, Wyatt would spend his life praising the values of a cat, and Clara Ridgway of the Tudor Society writes that Wyatt is recorded that he, quote, would ever make much of cats as other men will of their spaniels or hounds. So he's a big fan of this cat. So whatever happened in the Tower of London, he came away loving cats. Now, even though cats made practical house guests, because they could catch mice, there was some confusion about the cat's relationship with plague. During the Middle Ages, cats were associated with the rise in bubonic plague, and once the cat had this reputation under its belt, that's when the Middle Ages gave us the Great Cat Massacre, which saw an estimated 50% of the feline population in Europe killed because they were superstitious. You see, bubonic plague was spread across Europe by fleas on rats. The cat ate the rat, and this helps keep down the rodent population, which keeps down the plague. However, in the minds of some, and keep in mind that no one had sorted out the flea source of plague yet, so there was only a connection between cats and plague, but no one exactly knew what the connection was. And many people were unsure what was causing the plague, and so since there was an association, they got scared of cats and once the cats took the blame for plague, they would often be rounded up and killed. The problem with exterminating all the cats, however, is that once they started eradicating the cats, the rodent population shot back up, which meant millions of rats carrying fleas infected with bubonic plague is now considered one of the main reasons the Black Death spread across Europe. When the persecution of cats finally ended in the late 17th century, the cats were able to hunt the rats again, and Europeans saw these natural hunters keep their towns rodent free and the plague decreased. Once they figured out that cats weren't trying to kill them through plague, many people discovered the cat is a great companion animal. Paintings from Shakespeare's lifetime demonstrate cats holding an affectionate place in the lives of 16th and 17th century residents. There are cats playing in the kitchen, kids playing with cats on the floor, and, and cats being depicted as a family member, which explains our first quote of cats 
lapping up milk. As they became popular household pets, people started breeding cats specifically for this purpose. There's record of a ship that crashed off the Isle of Man in the 15th to 16th centuries. And included on the list of the cargo for that ship is the first pedigree cat called the Manx. The American short hair cat is considered as descending from this Manx cat. Christopher Columbus brought cats to America on his ships and they did very well here. So Columbus can be credited with giving us cats. Thank you, Columbus. Cats were very useful mouse catchers on ships as well. They were small, they were easy to carry and the mice already on the ship functioned as the cat's food. So you didn't have to bring anything extra for the cat. Being easy to carry, they were considered a great asset on these kinds of voyages. Superstition reigned supreme in Tudor England, however, and the conflicted reputation of the cat oscillated continually with the odd but verifiable truth that cats would be used to ward off mice by taking the body of a dead cat and the body of a dead rat and intentionally building it into the construction of a new home, with the superstition being that having them in the walls of your house would keep rats out of your home. Now, this was not at all proven to be an effective mouse repellent, but we do have records of embalmed cat and mouse bodies discovered inside the walls of houses from the 15th and 16th century, demonstrating that, as Shakespeare would say, this little factoid is as strange as it is true. But while we may never know for certain whether William Shakespeare owned a cat, with all of this history and indeed drama about the feline swirling around his lifetime, it's no wonder Shakespeare mentions the cat over 30 times in his collected works. And I personally find it plausible to think that William himself might have had a cat at his home in Stratford or perhaps even catching mice at the Globe. And if you enjoy Shakespeare's history and learning more facts like cats in Tudor England, you can join me every Monday and Saturday for new episodes. Learn more about me and my episodes at castycash.com. Thank you for being here for my presentation today. I hope you enjoy the conference. Bye-bye.